Our next speaker is Sarah Chang. Before coming to Scripps, Sarah worked in the environmental education field, creating programs that facilitated youth-led conservation projects. While working in St. Lucia, she saw how quickly environmental changes were happening and the wide range of impacts they had on small island communities. She came to the program to strengthen her technical skills and develop an interdisciplinary understanding of conservation so that she could move into the marine resource management and planning sector. She hopes to return to another small island to implement all the things she's learned during this program. And the title of her presentation is Going the Distance, Exploring Spatial Relationships Between Resorts and Reefs in the Maldives. Thanks, Samantha. Take a dive into the Maldives, and this is what you see. During a recent scientific assessment, divers counted over 300,000 fish, enough that if you line them up head to tail, would stretch over 16 miles long. Underwater, it's easy to lose yourself in the nooks and crannies of the reef. But in the Maldives, one of the most geographically dispersed countries in the world, it's important to think about the bigger picture and how the environment and daily life are connected. The Republic of the Maldives is located in the Indian Ocean and is made up of about 1,200 islands grouped into 26 atolls. Atolls are rings of coral that form when an interior island sinks beneath the water. These coral formations are so central to the country that the word atoll actually comes from the Maldivian language. In addition to literally being built on these coral reefs, marine resources provide almost all the protein for local diet, as well as supports the country's two major industries, tourism and fisheries. To most of the world, the Maldives is best known for its luxury tourism. The country uses a one island, one resort model in which each resort occupies its own private island. Maldivian tourism started with the opening of the first resort in 1972 and the industry has since experienced rapid growth. Last year, over 1.7 million tourists visited the country. This animation shows the spatial growth of the industry over time. You can see that the resorts started in the central atolls, mainly around the capital city of Malé, which is where there is a major airport, as well as the majority of the population and services. As the industry has grown, you can see that the resorts are starting to radiate out to all ends of the archipelago. Currently, there are 152 resorts in operation in the Maldives, seen here in yellow, and 115 seen in red, are new lease, newly leased areas for planned or um, currently in development uh, resorts. Like in many small island countries, tourism and the environment are closely connected. The beautiful beaches and marine biodiversity is what draws most people to the Maldives in the first place. But at the same time, there are also environmental impacts that come with an increase in tourist presence. One of the impacts of tourism and the focus of my project has to do with what all these tourists are eating. And what they're eating is reef fish, predominantly larger bodied species found on coral reefs. Past assessments show that as tourism grows, so does the consumption of reef fish, increasing from 1,000 tons in 1991 to 5,300 tons in 2012. Additionally, the price of reef fish has been rising, indicating an increase in the value of the resource. However, a lack of data makes it difficult to fully understand the status of reef fish in the Maldives. First, the term reef fish is a catch-all phrase to describe any species caught off a coral reef. Anecdotal evidence suggests that jacks, snappers, and emperors make up the majority of the catch, but there are still uh, unknowns around the prevalence of other target species. Additionally, reef fish brought to landing sites are monitored, but anything sold directly to resorts is not. If tourists are some of the primary consumers of these reef fish, there is a potentially large portion of the catch that's going unaccounted for. This lack of data hinders the ability to monitor the true impact of fishing on these reef ecosystems. So for my project, I wanted to look at any spatial relationships between resort locations and reef fish populations. During the process, process of this project, I also hope to address the lack of data by creating publicly available maps as well as building a tool to support fisheries management planning. Today I'm going to focus on some of the main findings of the data as well as how I created a platform 
where data could be viewed spatially and interactively. There were four main components to my workflow. The first step was to create a set of maps in ArcGIS that showed the locations of different human variables, such as where, island, uh, where communities and resorts were located. Most of the existing databases that I found were either regional or out of date. So by aggregating and cross-checking information and using visual assessment from satellite imagery, I was able to bring all the information into one place to create countrywide up-to-date maps. This information included things like geographic coordinates of docks and harbors, resort sizes, and navigable waterways. Next, I mapped the location of all 127 survey sites from a recent coral reef assessment led by the Blue Prosperity Coalition, a group of organizations collaborating with the Maldivian government to create marine management plans. In order to identify any relationship between human impact and fish populations, I classified each survey site as either resort, community, or uninhabited. I created five kilometer buffers around each resort and community island to represent the distance a reef fisherman might travel. Any survey site that was within those buffers was given that classification of that respective buffer. So for example, here, any survey site in this blue buffer was classified as a resort, as a resort site. Anything in the pink was a community site, and then anything that was outside of a buffer was classified as uninhabited. During the Blue Prosperity expedition trip, divers conducted underwater visual fish surveys to, um, to see which species were found at each site. This included identifying fish to the nearest species as well as estimating their total length. This information was used to calculate biomass or the collective weight of all the fish. Finally, all the data was put into an interactive web application that integrates GIS maps with the fish biomass data. So what did we learn from all this information? When we looked at the fish biomass by site, we found no statistically significant difference between the site types. This graph shows the biomass per site, with purple representing community islands, blue as resort islands, and green as uninhabited islands. The top portion is showing biomass of all species, um, while the bottom portion shows the biomass of target or consumable species, which we classified as individuals larger than 20 centimeters and those that could be caught using a hook and line, which is the most common form of reef fishing in the Maldives. While there is variability, the average biomass across all sites was about 290 grams per meter squared. To put that into context, here is a graph showing the Maldives fish biomass in comparison to other islands. The colors, represent the, the colors represent the biomass of species in each level of the food chain, also known as trophic levels. You can see that the Maldives have a relatively high level of biomass, but what is most striking is that the, the structure of the trophic levels is very different. In the Maldives, you can see there's a large portion of herbivore, herbivores, as represented by the green section, and almost no apex predators represented with red. This is even more evident when you look at the biomass breakdown by site. And you can see that apex predators were only seen at nine of the 120 survey, 127 survey sites. Top predators, uh, which are larger bodied bony fish like jap jacks and snappers, make up about 15% of the target species biomass at each site. This lack of apex and top predators indicates the presence of fishing, as species in these trophic levels are typically the first to be caught due to their more aggressive nature and likelihood to bite a hook and line. On the other hand, there is a significant amount of herbivores across all sites. On average, herbivorous fish made up 52% of the biomass. This large presence of herbivores, especially parrotfish, plays an important role in maintaining the healthy reef ecosystems. By constantly grazing, herbivorous fish keep the algae in check and allow corals to grow. In recent years, the Maldives have experienced ser several serious coral bleaching events that left many reefs either bleached or dead. However, during the Blue Prosperity Expedition trip, many of the survey sites we visited were peppered with lots of baby corals. 
The large presence of herbivores might be playing a role in, in maintaining these healthy reefs and allowing for the recovery by uh, reducing the amount of competition between algae and new corals. These biomass observations just graze the surface of the amount of information um, collected during the scientific assessment. There are many opportunities to, for deeper exploration and for refinement of human and spatial variables. This brings me to the final part of my project, which was to develop a platform where all this data could be displayed, shared, and used for future research. Using Esri Dashboard, I created a dynamic web application where you can interact with the data. By moving and zooming in on the map, all the graphs change to reflect the sites in view. The top set of charts looks at total biomass of all and target species, first by distance to the nearest resort measured in kilometers, and then comparing the site types, looking at resort, community, and uninhabited sites. They're looking at both total and target species biomass. The lower set of charts breaks biomass down into trophic level and family. All of these charts have the ability to turn on and off certain categories so that you can filter your results. You also have the option of selecting sites from the list in order to make specific comparisons. For example, here I have selected three sites, all from the same atoll, but representing the different site types. By clicking through the graphs, you can see how, these, um, how the biomass is broken down within each site, as well as how it compares to each other. As the tourism industry continues to expand and the demand for reef fish grows, it will become increasingly important for the Maldives to monitor and manage their reef fish fishery. This includes implementing strategies to recover top predators, as well as regulations to protect the abundance of parrotfish. By developing a sustainably managed fishery now, they have the opportunity to be proactive rather than reactive when it comes to maintaining healthy ecosystems. In order to develop these plans, the availability of baseline data as well as the spatial understanding of that data will be key, especially in the face of future tourism development. This project can be used to support marine resource planners in building fisheries management plans, and these maps will provide some of the spatial information necessary for understanding the interactions between these two important industries. I would like to thank my capstone committee, Dr. Brian Zieglinski, Dr. Sarah Lester, and Amy Work for their unending support throughout this whole project. Um, also, thank you to the Scripps MAS NBC staff, Wade Institute, 100 Island Challenge, and Hannah and Sarah from the Maldives Marine Research Institute for their additional guidance and support. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. <clears throat> All right, so we have a question from the web. How often would you recommend a refresh of data collection, especially considering the expected doubling in number of resorts in the Maldives? Thanks for that question. Um, I don't think there's ever anything wrong with getting as much data as possible. Um, logistically, it's a challenging place to collect data just because it is so geographically spread out. Um, one of the really cool things about the Blue Prosperity Coalition and their partnership with the Maldivian government is that it is a long-term plan, and so they will be conducting scientific assessments um, so that they can track these changes over time. Thank you. And Sarah, is there an ideal trophic structure that would indicate a healthy reef to you? Um, so the trophic, trophic structure can be impacted by a lot of different variables from oceanographic to biological features, so it's hard to say if there is really like an ideal structure. Uh, that being said, you definitely want to see representation at every trophic level because there are species within those levels that fulfill so specific ecological roles and ecological niches to, that are important for maintaining a healthy reef. So in the case of the Maldives, while the biomass was relatively high, the fact that we didn't see representation of those top trophic levels indicates that something is happening to remove those species from the, the ecosystem. 
Great. And the last question uh, that we've got is, what does the future of the tourism industry look like in the Maldives? And are there regulations in development? Um, so as you saw from those two graphs of the planned and current resorts, they're definitely on a growth trajectory. Um, development zones are typically um, approved by the president. There is an environmental impact assessment process that must be completed by developers. Um, but I think an interesting upcoming aspect of the tourism industry is that in 2008, they decided to open up guest houses on community islands. So that will potentially create another aspect of um, reef fish demand within the tourism industry. Thank you.